Hello, YouTubeiverse. Up next, Cosmic Queries, Star Talk, the worlds between planets and stars. This is Star Talk. I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And today we're going to have a Cosmic Queries edition of Star Talk with my co host, Chuck Nice. Yes. Chuck, baby. Hey, Neil. All right. What's Someone happening? in between us here. That's right. I got my friend and colleague. Yes. Not only professional colleague, but museum colleague, Jackie Faraday. That's right. Hi. Jackie in the Hi. house. Hi, in, in, the, in two houses. <laughs> Double house Double here. House. A double house. <laughs> Uh, Jackie is one of the world's experts on the the worlds that exist between planets and stars. Wow. Mm -hmm. There's yes. not a sharp boundary there. You might have thought so, or right. maybe you never thought about it. She's thought about it. Yes. And she and her, peep, and her peeps. She's got a whole community of people. In fact, after we hired her, she brought other people after she came. So this place, the American right. Museum of Natural History, right. is one of the intellectual centers of this subject. Because it is woman right here. That's correct. That's Pump really that cool. One Give me like a no, yeah. one right. I'm going to take ownership of that. You sure? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we actually have a, our research group has uh, stickers and t-shirts and logo. We have a logo. Uh, and we made it out of. Is that the logo with the, with the. With the, the subway, the subway symbol. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Really like the, because our subway symbols in New York City are circles yes. with letters inside of yes, them. Yes, they are. So yeah. what are yeah. what is what's your design there? So we are BDNYC, oh. which stands for Brown Dwarfs right. in New York City mm -hmm. Research Group. Plus a B train stops at this institution. It certainly so does. does the C. That, that, that's correct. B and C. Mm -hmm. There you go. So so we've got uh, we solicited questions yes. on uh, from from our fan base. Telling them we're going to have the world's expert on this sort of nether world between mm -hmm. planets and stars. Yes. And in came hundreds of questions. Hundreds. Right. Yes. Hundreds. Hundreds That's of questions. Great. Yes. You've got them. And I've got them. Neither of us have seen it. No, you haven't. And Not that I'm, it's a test. No, no. I love shows like this when I have one of my, my astrophysics colleagues because mm -hmm. then I'll have to say a thing. Right, she knows everything. <laughs> I'll just I'm gonna go get lunch, and then you you tell me when you're done. Right, so yeah. I like that Neil saying I know everything. That's a nice that's a nice compliment. Thank that's you, good. Neil. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, listen. Why don't we jump into it with jump our in. first question, which is always from a Patreon patron. Okay, here we go. This is. AMZ Industries. Wow, we've gone corporate with Patreon patrons. <laughs> AMZ. AMZ that Industries. Very New York Stock Exchange listing. Uh, tell me about AMZ, it. AMZ uh, Industries. AMZ, right. Um, AMZ says um, the sun is the biggest star in our solar system. I believe it's also the only star in our solar system. Keep going. Okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. We're I'm just hold saying. that one, yeah. Okay. Uh, do we know a star or any other object in space or interstellar space that is? Bigger than our sun, okay. Mm. I, I, okay, uh, so just see, it's they just mixed galaxy with solar system. That's, that's what they all. did. That's all. thank you. Yes, I, uh -huh. I'm trying to figure this out, but you got mm -hmm. it. Yeah. That's what they did. So, uh, um, also to Jackie, um, do you believe in zodiac signs? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so. Okay, twofold question, both of which are interesting to answer. And they yes. both sound completely unrelated to each other. They are unrelated <laughs> to well, each other. Well, I, I think I, I believe. I think one is a genuine interest in the cosmos and a, and the other is a genuine interest in you. Okay. <laughs> oh, I love it. So, I will go with the first one is the sun in our Okay, so yes, it's the only star that we know of in our solar system. Although we have searched for another object that might be maybe not a star but one of these objects I study, a brown dwarf. Brown dwarf. That might be a companion to our own Sun, since it's alone, it's by itself. It doesn't have a partner. So Wait, we have to are be you orbiting really far away? Yeah, I was going to say because you're talking. Yep. About, what, 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 what I believe we're talking about. To, to tell me if I'm wrong, is that sometimes there are anomalies in the gravitational movement of objects in our neighborhood, right? So I think you're going with the Planet Nine explanation. Okay, that's what which I, is yeah. yeah, and that's also been been pulled on and is very popular right now. Planet right. Nine, not Pluto. Pl just to be oh, clear, yeah. right? Right. Yes. On this show, we got to be clear about that's it. Right. Okay. And also, we can discuss why that word planet's not very good in this context, anyway. Right. So an object outside of what's currently 
Pluto's position that might be tugging on tugging objects on other in objects. the outer part of the solar system. And the Kuiper belt, which is this 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 area of things that are left over from when the solar system formed. Uh, and whether or not there's something else that's well beyond that, right. possibly there's indications. Theorists certainly think that. Um, but um, but there was this nemesis hypothesis that existed several several years ago, okay. for which that possibly you could link up mass extinctions that happened on this planet with a highly eccentric other object that might have been the orbit is eccentric, right? Yes, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. orbit is eccentric. It's not emotionally eccentric. Right? It could have been right. emotionally. Eccentric. <laughs> Although it does spend a lot of time alone, so maybe you never know. Why are we giving emotions to the object? <laughs> like this is it. part of the problem. <laughs> People put so much emotion on these objects. Look, they want to feel them. Yeah. Yeah. If you, you just call the thing eccentric. That's all. <laughs> yes, yeah. eccentric. Right. So okay. uh, so that it would have an eccentric orbit uh, and that possibly it was every time it got into some area of the outer solar system, it would kick a bunch of stuff in uh, towards the uh, towards our area and right. cause possibly mass extinctions. The comets that would then hit right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Comets, uh, asteroids. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's, that's basically we've looked – Far and near, and we haven't found anything. Gotcha. So possibly that's out. Um, so Nemesis but, was the proposed name if such an object existed, and that would have been its name had we found it. Yeah, yeah. and Nemesis is the idea that it's our Nemesis, right. the Earth's Nemesis, not right. necessarily the Sun's, right. the Earth's, because if it's gonna uh, basically if it's launching, us, if it's launching crap at us, <laughs> solve them. Yes. Exactly. Why would you want that? <laughs> right. so that would feel like that, your nemesis, yeah, right? Sure, sure. So that okay. So beyond that, the question's asking if there's a um, a star that's bigger than our, our own sun, and that's like, yeah, yeah. definitely. Right. There's so many. My favorite star in the the nighttime sky is called Eta Carina. Eta Carina. You know Eta Carina. Eta Carina's Love a me some Eta Carina. I, and I love the fact that it actually sounds like a pop star. You know what I mean? Eta? Yeah. Eta Carina. Yeah. yeah. You know? It's in the constellation Carina. Mm-hmm. Uh, they make and- a good ice cream flavor. That Eta Carina. You said, no, I, I no, ate a Carina? No, no, Carina is the name of the flavor. So and I, I ate a Carina. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, I wouldn't have put that in there, but okay. <laughs> All right. I it's like got, It's in the homunculus nebula. Can you make <laughs> that you one as a, like the homunculus yeah. nuts that somehow somebody could make that you'd put on the ice cream? Well, so Eta Carina is a very large star. Um, we now think that it's actually two stars, a binary star system. Oh. Uh, we call it a luminous blue variable. It's this object that's very, very massive. And so we think it's two and so 40 to 50 times the mass of our, our own sun, but probably two of them. They go around each other, eclipsing each other so that you can actually see the light of one dip very, very periodically. So and that's a variability you were talking about. Yeah. 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 So yeah. L- let me just ask you this. Uh, even though it's a body moving in front or transiting another body how, how is one slightly larger than the other because where they're both luminous yeah so the idea of a transit is one blocks light from the other but if they're both glowing what what are you measuring? So they're not the exact same mass. Okay. Uh, so you'd have one that's say sixty times the mass of a sun, and the other is thirty times the mass of I the gotcha. sun. I got you. All right. There's even some hypothesis that there's a triple system in there. There's three, not just two. Wow. So I'm noting Eta Carina because I think it is just an awesome star. Uh, or star system, but are that's there, not the good most Hubble massive. photos of that, right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You check yeah. that out. Yeah, we might put one on the website here. Yeah, you should. Oh, that's cool. Because mm-hmm. it was part of an HST legacy project, Hubble Space Telescope. Yeah. Or, sorry, Hubble uh-huh. Space Telescope. Yeah. Yes. Don't apologize. That's, just, yeah, you're, you're right. You're in the lingo, I'm, girl. I'm in the lingo. Do the lingo <laughs> thing. <laughs> HST and the elemental P. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. Uh-huh. Um, and it it's a uh, so there's there's a lot of data on and on Eta Carina, uh, but it's not the most massive. You get even more massive. There's mm-hmm. 100, 200 times the mass of our own sun. Wow! And these are not stable systems. This is these again stars. we're not referring to their motions, Jim. right? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> have eccentric stars and unstable stars. <laughs> I like where this is going. <laughs> yeah. We also have degenerate stars as well. That's another thing. Too. Really? Yes, nice it's, it's an actual. Kind of stuff. Is that okay? I, yeah. I I can't even tell you what. Forget it. <laughs> I just my mind immediately went to a star. And just, just for like, constellation weenies mm-hmm. out there, uh, Carina is a constellation visible primarily in the southern hemisphere, and it's part of the constel. It's part of a much larger constellation that used to be one piece, mm-hmm. and it's the the ship of uh, the Argonauts. 
Okay, Argo Navis is the ship, and it's just it, I mean, is the is the is the keel? I think the keel. Yeah. Yeah. So what they did was that sh- that constellation was way too big for its britches, mm-hmm. so they broke it up into parts. So there's a compass, there's a sail, there's the hull, there's the there, and so this is it is the eta if brightest right object in the constellation Carina. So alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Epsilon, Zeta, Eta. So it'll be the seventh brightest star. And that's important also because it's not always the Eta because that's what it was cataloged at. But at one time, it was one of the brightest stars in the nighttime sky oh. because the thing is going through massive and insane explosions. And it's just dumping material off, which is creating That makes the gorgeous, beautiful photos. Yes, oh, the nebula wow. that's around it is so unbelievably attractive to look at. And that's just from but Chuck, just it's really a crime dumps scene. of material. <laughs> What's that? It's, yeah. it's, it's really a crime scene. Right. You get to see this gas just oh, spilling out. So it's good. Like something happened down in yeah, there. Yeah, something bad something happened. Bad and happened. something is continually bad happening. <laughs> I mean, I would love to fly close and have a look at that thing. And you wouldn't want to be close as a human because there's probably a, a lot, lot of, of radiation. really bad radiation yeah. around there. Yeah. But man, would it be a sight. Because it is really pretty. Mm. That's very to cool. To the human eye. So Ada Carina. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Well, also, the sun is large enough. If you hollowed it out, right. you could pour a million Earths into it. Our sun. Our sun. Right. And now we're talking about stars bigger than that. that That's right. all. That's much, exactly. bigger. That's right. much, much bigger. Much, so much these, bigger. And so these yeah. supermassive stars, these are... These are the ones that become black holes. Like our sun couldn't become a black hole, no. could it? No. Our sun couldn't become a black hole. Not no. massive enough. But these are these are the ones like you look at these stars, the luminous blue variables, and then there's another kind. They're called Wolf Rayette stars. So there's actually somebody Wolf here. Wolf Rayette? Yes. Uh, yes. Actually debatable if it's Wolf Rayette well, or Wolf Well, these are two Ray-A. people who, who's Oh, is that the deal? Paper. So the people did they discover this? Or? Well, they they first studied them okay. in, in an important way. All right. And so then realized that no other stars look like those do, so they became their own category. Nice. Wolf Rayet. Wolf Rayet. R-A-Y-E-T. Okay. Yeah. If it's French, you, you, leave, you don't pronounce the trailing consonant. Right, right. so recently. Wolf Rayet. Nice. All right, and for the uh, second question. Uh, Re- reread that, please. Uh, which oh, right. is, uh, do you believe in zodiac signs? Uh, so what I, I, I believe is such an interesting thing. There are constellations in the nighttime sky, which are the markers for where the ecliptic of the path that the sun takes in the sky and all the planets and the moon they take. Uh, and so those are designations in the sky and that is it's where the the um, the sun and the planets and the moon all move. Yeah. I don't place any significance on um, what people like to do in reading their astrological a uh, sign. Mm. I'm actually not even sure what my sign is. Oh wow! Mm. When were you born? Mm. Not totally true. I do know what it is, but I'm, oh, okay. I'm just, but you don't think about it or care. I don't about think it. about it yeah, too it's much. Not a thing, mm-hmm. right? Mine is cancer. I'm a festering malignancy. <laughs> Thank you. Does it feel accurate? <laughs> oh man! <laughs> All right. All right. Enough, enough of that. Thank Let's, you, Jackie. Yeah, for that. that right. was great. Okay. Yeah. Wow! Right. I got so much Chuck, out of that, man. What else you got there? All right. Why don't we? Um, Let's see. How about um, this is uh, Sherman from San Diego. Says, Are we still on the Patreon? Or this no? is a Patreon still patron. Okay. Oh. Sherman from hi, San Sherman. Diego. Sherman says, uh, hi, Dr. Tyson. And hi, Dr. Faraday. Understanding that it's only been a few decades since the discovery of the first exoplanets, there is still a lot we don't know about even the closest ones to our solar system. What tools and or resources are needed in the works or in the works to help us better understand the nature and composition of these objects? Mm. So that's a very good question. Um, is there is there anything new and exciting that helps us? Can I, can I help pre-pen us? that question by, just by asking yeah. you, are your methods and tools mm-hmm. to find the worlds between planets and stars, do you have overlap with the methods and tools of those who are finding planets? Yeah, and I actually yeah. think this would drive the question of what do we mean when we say the word planet in this particular instance? Mm-hmm. Because the objects that I study that are that I get the most excited about studying are ones that we sometimes refer to as rogue worlds, mm-hmm. as they are the same mass as the objects that others might want to call a planet. Mm-hmm. But those objects orbit a star. And the ones that I study don't orbit a star. They're in between... Oh. Yeah, they just, they're off there, they're alone, they have no host star. Homeless. So there's nothing. They're homeless. Yeah, we call them orphan, uh, to be nicer maybe. Man. Wow. Orphan, uh, homeless, I'm a, I'm a orphan, orphan world. 
the orphaned objects that are out there. Mm-hmm. So that what I do, because it's uh, a lot easier for you to attempt to get to what's in the atmospheres of these objects when they don't have a host star that you have to block the right. light of because the contrast oh, ratio is so large. I never thought about that. It's so much is easier. Is that like, like seeing a, a firefly in a, in a Hollywood searchlight? Mm-hmm. You can't, the, the brightness contrast is so Ah, you can't see the the dim things. Mm-hmm. So you got objects where there's no main star. So it's just the it's object just the itself. Objects. Yeah. Very good. Just it on its own. But this is where it gets controversial, right? Because it, it could be the exact same mass, temperature, gravity, the whole deal that we would call an object around another star. But because we find it alone, we call them brown dwarfs. Uh, and when they're the lowest mass, so not getting too far down this rabbit hole, which I assume you want me to define what a brown dwarf is at some point. Oh, yeah, I, I was going to yeah, say. Okay, okay. Right. It's probably important for your audience to understand what I'm an expert in. <laughs> but, but just quickly, you're saying that location matters in how you classify mm-hmm. such an object. We don't have a good running definition right now yeah, it is. for okay. what it is that we'll call this high mass end problem outside of our own solar system. High mass planet. High mass planet. High so, mass uh, so planet or so what, brown, so what's a brown dwarf? dwarf? So brown dwarfs are these objects that exist in mass in between stars and planets or whatever, the gray area in between. And the idea being that when you form a star, you have a giant molecular cloud of hydrogen and it fragments into pieces. Whatever causes the fragmentation, the compression of the gas, it, it breaks off into to pieces. The smallest possible pieces that could fragment off. Wait, wait. So you have the main piece, that's the main star. Well, it fra- lots of pieces, right? Like okay, but, but one of them is going to... The big one's going to be the star. In there the could be presumably. hundreds of them that'll be stars. Oh, yeah. of course. All right. right. Yeah. So now you got the other bits and pieces going. Yeah. So there'll be a whole spectrum, a whole distribution of objects that will break off out of a gigantic molecular cloud. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this molecular cloud will break down into, once you compress it, mm-hmm. so that all of the gas then gets pushed together. And then uh, enough so that the pressure there ignites the cores of these things that break off into tiny pieces. The smallest of the pieces end up being these objects that don't even know that they don't have enough mass to get the core hot enough to get nuclear burning going. But they do it anyway? No. No, <laughs> no this is they why- They think they're going to be a star, but, but they're, they're not. not. So what, right, now you guys are putting emotion on it. Yeah. They don't know what they should or shouldn't be. They're just existing. And so this this is why people called them failed stars. Right. Because they're not getting enough mass. But I look at it and like, whatever, dude. Like, who cares? It is existing with not enough mass. That's fine. It doesn't have the mass. Instead, it can't get that nuclear engine going that's at the center of our sun. Right. Instead, it's like a coal plucked from a fire. It just cools through its life. And that's it. And that is in between. Basically, what we say is the top mass for that that it happens is 75 times the mass of the Jupiter. 75 Jupiters. That would be a star. That's Above the that is a star. border, yes. right? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And this is very metallicity dependent, like how much how much metallicity, how, mm-hmm. many, how much what's, iron What's metallic? Oh, okay, I got yeah, you. Yeah. Heavy so elements. at the core, like, yeah, okay, okay. Heavy elements. Right, right, right. Uh, so how much of that was available will change, like how much mass you need to get the core burning. But then uh, the lower end of it, the low end, I don't know. What's the lowest mass fragment that you can break off? This is a huge discussion in astronomy right now. Mm. What is the lowest mass piece that breaks off? And still becomes a thing. And still becomes and a, a thing. And is a thing. That, right. All right. That thing that doesn't know what it is. But then, <laughs> wait, one last thing on it. One last thing, because I know we have to stop. But the planet would be opposite end of this. Can you form an object, the planets form, in a disk around a star? But how big can it get? around a star. So now you've got two competing things. You've got objects that form by breaking up a cloud that then self fragments and blah, 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 blah. And then you've got a disc around a forming star and how big can that object get? Um, Wow. Okay. Planet versus brown dwarf. We gotta take a quick break. Mm -hmm. So that's the brown dwarf establishment right, right. there as there opposed go. to my brown dwarf which was uh the dwarf that was never painted by disney because he was racist <laughs> <laughs> the eighth dwarf yes <laughs> chuck wow. has issues we getting him through chuck. when we come back more with jackie Faraday on the worlds between planets and stars <laughs> on star talk we're big fans of Storyblocks here at Star Talk. We have a small team that puts together your favorite show, and we use Storyblocks' unlimited plan to get more 4K stock footage than we know what to do with. I mean, really, they even have footage 
of a monkey on a rope and a gorilla with a piggy bank. And that's the same gorilla with a pizza. They've also got loads of audio and video, too. It's royalty-free, so you can use it anywhere. Create like a pro with Storyblocks. Swing on over to the description to learn more. See what I did there? That's storyblocks.com slash StarTalk. We're back. Star Talk, Cosmic Queries, the worlds between stars and planets. Where are they? What are they? We got a word for them, but do we understand them? And our best chance of understanding them is this woman right here. Yes. Jackie Faraday in the house. Yes, yes. Friend and colleague at, in, the house. in the Department of Astrophysics right here at the American Museum of Natural History. And you just went, you just described something I hadn't fully appreciated just mm-hmm. before the break that you have this humongo gas cloud, mm-hmm. a, a molecular cloud, they call them, and it'll break into bits. And these are typically stars, but some might not be stars. In addition to that, each one of these will have a disk of material surrounding it that will then break up into little bits beyond the bits that just broke off to make the thing that had the disk. Mm-hmm. Did I did I understand that? You're doing good. Yeah, I'm yeah. Okay. I, will, I will say right. So those so, are so the two th- dynamic, two different kinds of phenomenon going on. Two different formation mechanisms. Formation mechanism. That's yeah. the phrase I'm looking for. Right. <clears throat> and so we want to use that as definitional for saying like, what kind of object are you looking at? I'd prefer to know how it formed because can you eject these objects that form around a star? Yeah, you do. Oh, a hundred percent you do. Yeah. They're launched off. We probably we ejected stuff all sorts of ways when we, we might have had like we 30 planets our... or something at that yes. one, right? Yes, exactly. And now we're down to eight. Get over it. Um and so all all is would be rogue <laughs> planets by now. Rogue or worlds. Eaten, or eaten. Rogue worlds. I like rogue worlds rogue, rather than planets. Rogue just worlds. Or could have any of them become joined forces to become like get picked up by another star. Yeah, get picked up by another star. Yeah. So yeah. we talk about that too. That's Ooh. pretty hard to do, but not impossible. Okay. It's possible that it could happen. Uh they could also they get scattered around. And we have evidence for this material now. Like present day, we have material that has passed through our own solar system after it probably got ejected from a totally different solar system. Nice. This object called Oumuamua, which is a a interstellar asteroid right. rock that came flying through here, and that probably got dumped out when uh, its own sun was forming its solar system. So the, the one thing on this, that though, right. that ain't right. I know. Yeah. Yeah. It is okay. Like don't you, let the doorknob hit you, oh, Moa Moa. <laughs> but don't you think? Oh, <laughs> Moa, by the way, is Hawaiian for scout, and it's repeated a Moa Moa for emphasis. So gotcha. it's basically first scout. Gotcha. Would, right. And it was named that because it was on a tel- it was found through a telescope in Hawaii, mm-hmm. the Pan Stars Telescope, which is a yeah. wonderful telescope. And uh, as an homage to Hawaii, the mm-hmm. they chose this wonderful the wine language. Name. Yeah, right. So, so just uh, I did this calculation long ago. This mm-hmm. is the perfect time for me to invoke it. All right, because how often does Let's one get to it. invoke a calculation? Sweet. If there were four bumblebees flying in the continental United States, okay. The chances of them accidentally bumping into each other are greater than any two stars in our galaxy. Oh, I have a response to this. Wait. Wow. So, wait, so, wait. But if you want to talk about how empty space is between that's, that's stars. That's how much stuff is not there. It's not there. For so, them to so if you have if you have rogue things cast off, there's still the unlikelihood that you would even come into the vicinity of another star. But even if you did, you're going to have a velocity that's hard to trap. Suppose so, so f- Oumuamua had hyperbolic velocity, so we're not, right. it's coming through and it's, coming it, through it's not even looking back. Like, right. No, right. it has it's nothing to do with us. Busters. Right, like we didn't yeah. capture it, we're not doing anything We're not doing a it. damn thing. To it, it just, it came through like beep, beep, here I come, there mm-hmm. I go. And even looking at its motion, uh, its velocity, yeah. it looked like maybe we were its first pass, yeah. possibly. This is very hard to tease out, but there was a paper on that, whether or not we were the first. A research paper, yeah. A research paper that mm-hmm. was looking at whether or not we were its first encounter. After right. it departed, and we traced, we look. Astronomers tried to trace it back and see where it might have come right. from. Find the t- right. So now, with that in mind, did we're the first pass? Did we alter its course? Oh, great question. Yeah. Like, uh, I don't know. Maybe. Well, Probably yeah, yeah. a little bit. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, it feels. Yeah. yeah. You can. You can. You can. You. You can not get captured, but still feel what's going on here. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. So if you if you look at, they have the. The trajectory. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And the yeah, trajectory's yeah. arc, right? Uh, okay. In response to the gravity of Jupiter and the Sun. Interesting. But when you put in, put Jupiter enough of a 
change in the velocity that when it gets to the next star, it's really obvious. Like, oh, this is its next stellar encounter. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure we can tease it out quite yet because it still looks like a disc. It's like a disc object. Mm -hmm. Just sort of flying around in the disc of the Milky Way. Nice. Um, beep, beep. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. On this, this is important because Neil, you What's may want to. What's that TV wanna... show? What's that? Um, Road the Runner. Jetsons. No, oh. no, the Jetsons. Oh, flying uh, the flying cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Jetsons. I thought yeah. you were doing beep, beep from the. It's before your time. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe. She's like, okay. Okay. Yeah, Jetsons were so before uh, everybody's it. time. <laughs> yeah, okay. I watched it when I was a kid, so I don't know why it's. Before the Road Runner did a beep, beep too. Yes, he did. Yeah. You know, I just learned recently, but this mm -hmm. had nothing to do with anything. The Road Runner. Never left the road. How about when he was standing on air and the coyote would fall? No, the coyote's standing on air. The oh, Roadrunner isn't. That's true. Yeah. Oh, huh. Interesting. Yeah, the okay. runner stops before it gets to the edge of the cliff. And it's always on the road. That's interesting. Hence, the Roadrunner. Yeah. I have another point on Stellar Fly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to just pull us back in here, Neil. Um, so you might- You like my pop culture references? I'm sorry. I, do, I love it, I love it, okay. I love it, I love it. It's so great. Um, but the, one of the things that I think is massively uh, interesting right now in astronomy is how many times stars not run into each other, but interact with one, one another. Mm -hmm. So the issue of, and this is, this is my new thing, I'm really into the new villain of planetary architecture, is the stellar flyby. Mm. The unappreciated um, influence that stars that move by each other can have. And the reason why I say that- Flyby looting. <laughs> flybys that will change the court the change the structure of maybe your planetary system or mm -hmm. now like okay so the question i think had something to do with what we're understanding about exoplanets and and learning about it in the future so here's one for everybody in one million years just about one million it's like 1.1 million years okay let me put put that on my, on my put the the i don't put it on I the can't calendar get october 12 nah, october 12 well, you know, 1 million plus, years plus or minus like 10,000 years yes but um, but there will be a stellar flyby, so it, at its closest encounter, by a star that's smaller than our own sun, but we're headed for each other. And in one million years, it's going to pass within our Oort cloud. It's coming straight in. So the Oort cloud, the outer region of comets, that's a spherical zone. Very distant, but very there. Very there. Cool. Very With there. lots of material. Yeah, this is like an, trillions of comets just... Okay, that just sounds, waiting to strike. I was going to say that sounds <laughs> catastrophic. <laughs> it's I, it, it's so, dun, we've dun, looked dun, at dun, it. Dun, 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 <laughs> yeah, <laughs> astronomers have looked at it to see like is the dun, dun, you know is it going to be a disaster? Uh, and the conclusion is it's uncertain, but the impact that it'll have on the Oort cloud might not be super bad. However, Jan Oort was the Dutch astronomer who first calculated the existence of the Oort cloud. It's so far away you can't see the objects that at that distance, but when they come in, you see them near the sun and you look at their trajectory, and you say, oh, this you much right terminate there. way at, mm -hmm. out at this distance before mm -hmm. it comes back again. The calls are coming from inside the house. Okay. <laughs> well, like, so, <laughs> <That's good>. <laughs> <laughs> so if you think about it, the Oort cloud actually stretches a third of the way to the closest star. Mm -hmm. A third of the way. Wow. It's, it's, it gets loose. So, I mean, think about that. You know, I mean, you get something that flies between us and... And that uh, that next closest object, it loosens up things because they've only barely held on to begin with. So barely any any held on. disturbance will completely right yeah, wreak havoc. And most important here is the consideration of we're constantly doing mission planning. Like, what are the next stages of mission planning? Right. And what's the what's the name of the star? Just so I know. So I, it's the Gliese seven a seven eighty. Okay. It's a it's one of these names that um, I constantly mix it with seven eighty versus seven eighty one. I think so. Okay. That's my fear of seven eighty one. As do we all. Gleason uh, seven. No, no, not Gleason. <laughs> Gleason. Yeah. G L E I S E. E S. Uh, G L I E S E E S E. It's a catalog of uh, with high high moving fast moving stars, right? Close, bright, so they're mostly fast moving. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, they're fast moving uh, in our field of view. So in order for that to be the case, they have to be nearby. So man, I was hoping it was Gleason. No, <laughs> <laughs> it ha no, that unfortunately. But, but just no. to be clear, no. in no. Norton. No. <laughs> so this is not a catalog of stars that are actually moving fast. It's a catalog of stars that are moving fast in our field of view. 
So you can have a bird fly by in front of you, mm -hmm. and it, and it, that's going maybe twenty miles an hour, and a plane that's moving past your field of view much more slowly. All right. And you're not going to say that, that the bird is the going bird faster going, than, yeah, than a plane. The, the bird is not going 600 miles an hour. Right. Right. So that angle matters, and that angle it manifests by its distance. So uh, there's a catalog of selected for their for their fast movement in our night sky, and those tend to be the nearest objects. Yeah, right, so you right. Got we're detecting objects. them. And so that one had been known, we've known about that star for a really long time. It's a bright, it's a very bright star. And it's, it's, it's- It's headed for us. We are headed for it, it's, it's heading headed. for us. And just think about it, it's probably got a solar system around it. And a North why, cloud, why and a not? Kuiper Belt. Why not? Why, why wouldn't the, it? Probably the majority of stars, why wouldn't why they wouldn't have they? them? Wow. And so when you think, I've got all of my, every time I give a science talk, I bring wave this up. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but don't you want to, we'll, we're going to see it. Totally like, want to get in it. In. Like, like people bring it here. <laughs> wait, wait, that means Let's, our Oort clouds will intersect. More than that, yes. The Oort clouds, the Kuiper Belts, possibly like whatever, whatever this thing's got around it, we could fly something to it. There's a lot of this discussion about going to Proxima Centauri because we all want to get there like now. The nearest we're star all to the sun, alive. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Gleese 780, man. Let's go. That's Let's gonna be even it. closer when it's close. Right. It's gonna be so close. She sounds like she's like ready to. I was gonna be there say, for and I am so ready to do this one million years from now. <laughs> she's talking like she got her telescope all ready for it. This is very sad because yeah, I'll you, be. You better take them longevity pills before that happens. <laughs> <laughs> no, by then we'll be able to upload your consciousness to a computer, That'll so be you'll so still be nice. around. Th that's good. Mm. Yeah, I'd like to see it when it happens. Cool, Chuck. What else you got? All right, so okay. This is, let's go for a quick one because I know we're running out of time in this segment. This is from Rossi King. Somehow, you could do a long one and then I tease the next segment, dude. This is how I do this. Well, you know, if we keep discussing this like this, we'll be do, able to do it with this short one. <laughs> <laughs> <All right>. Go. <laughs> no, this is Rossi King from YouTube. Uh, actually, I just wanted to ask this for myself too. Was Jupiter a failed star? And then the person says, I'm really glad it failed. Because I love it in the nighttime sky. Oh, very nice. oh how cute is that? That should be a quick answer. Yeah, <laughs> but it's super a field star, which, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, uh, uh, it's not, no. The quick answer to that would be no. But again, let's not call them failed stars. Let's just call them, well, Achieving one, planets? I call them <laughs> overexcited <laughs> planets. Thank you. Overachieving planets? <laughs> I'm not kidding, Neil. This That's is my coined hilarious. term. This is very modern teacher lingo, yes. right? For overexcited planets. That's what yeah. I sometimes call them, but then I don't like Don't planets. star shame me. Yeah. <laughs> don't star shame me. It. You guys are going I'm with it. I'm not exactly. a failed star. Exactly. Whoa. Jupiter shouldn't feel any in any way, shape, or form like it inadequate is. exactly right it is a, a behemoth of our solar system yes many times i say if i'm going to find an earth-like planet uh that i'll be comfortable saying yes let's let's consider that habitable i want a jupiter at a jupiter radius away because you know what jupiter does for us it protects us in a lot of ways okay. it's the bouncer of the solar system it. it's the one that's like taking hits for us because asteroids get dumped in and mm. comets are coming in and what does Jupiter do? It takes a lot of hits. Sure, it deflects some of them our way. Mm -hmm. Let's not talk about that part. Right. But, unless you want to, but I ID, would say- please. But uh, most of what it does is protect it's it, protect it shields it's us. It's protector, yeah. so right. I'd yeah. really like to see if we find like an object. The bouncer of the solar system. ID, yeah. please. Yeah. Standing out there. Mm, ID, exactly. please. <laughs> right, that's what it says to all the comments <laughs> they come in, like, nope. What? ID that's includes cool. what your trajectory is. Yeah, right? there you it's, go. It's trajectory, please. Right, right. Yeah. No, no, that ain't happening. <laughs> keep, keep walking, so. <laughs> so I would not call it a failed star. I'd call it the bouncer of the solar system. The nice. most important of the planets for Earth to consider right now. So how much more mass would it need to, for it to have ignited a core of energy? Or so, not even a core, well, for it to not have ignited a core of energy Well, this and, be, and become the overachieving planet. Right, so the brown dwarf <laughs> regime uh, is roughly the lower mass bound that we call is about 13 times the mass of Jupiter, but that, not a great number. That was a traditional number that so was used. So about a factor of 10. And, right, and the reason is because at that mass, you can get heavy hydrogen burning or de okay. de deuterium burning. Mm -hmm. And so because that tended to be a definitional thing where either the difference between a star and a brown dwarf is hydrogen burning, nuclear burning, hmm. and then it was kind of capped at the bottom end of like, well, at about 13 Jupiter masses, then it's deuterium burning that stops. And so, boom, that was the definition, and it's terrible. So the way to think about it is just if Jupiter had 
more than 10 times its current mass, it would start entering the brown dwarf regime. Yeah, it would be a massive okay. thing. But something about Jupiter, however, that yeah. just Jupiter would be proud, I think, is that yeah. it is emitting more energy than it is receiving from mm, the sun. Yes. So it is a net energy generating object in this solar system. It's state. like a blue state. Sorry, that was, that was very political. <laughs> <laughs> it was. I'll was fill in those details <laughs> after this break <laughs> when Star Talk continues mm. the world between planets and stars. My favorite thing to do on Storyblocks is to see how much work it must take to get all their stock videos. While I can just download them in seconds, just think what you'd have to do to get footage of Santa. You'd have to find reindeer, you gotta fly to the North Pole, mistake a cat for Santa, and once you finally found Santa, you ask him for a lot of money, go surfing with the jolly man, and then sit him down to get that shot with Santa. Check out the unlimited plan on Storyblocks for all the 4K video your little heart desires. Links in the description. That's storyblocks.com slash StarTalk. We're back on StarTalk. Cosmic Queries, the worlds between planets and stars. And we have one of the world's experts. Yes. On that, Jackie Ferry. Mm -hmm. One of my colleagues. She's my colleague. Mm -hmm. so yes. You know. Well, while I'm sitting I like here, Jack I can too. be her colleague <laughs> while I'm yeah. here. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Just no, we get comedians here, they're your colleagues. But I get one of my people, she's my colleague. Oh, Somehow I lose in this deal. <laughs> 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 so we were talking about Jupiter as right. not a failed star, but an, an overachieving planet. But still, it's a factor of 10 in mass away from having turned on as a star. So that's still kind of far away. It's not kissing the door, you know, kissing the boundary there, right? Factor right. 10. No, yeah. yeah. We're, it's a it's it's in squarely in the we're totally comfortable calling it a planet object. Right, right. It'd have to be quite a bit more massive before we start to feel awkward. There are other mm -hmm. systems. There's one called HR8799. It's the name of the star. Uh, and it has- Again, name for the catalog out of which they come, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, and th these stars also have multiple names, but that's the most popular of the names. I often call that system- that's the catchiest name. It's <laughs> <laughs> already 799. <laughs> that's the most popular. That's, that's that one just, that just rolls, rolls off the tongue. Yeah. Rolls that's like the, the share of the- <laughs> Yeah, HR8799. So I sometimes call HR8799 the Brad Pitt of planetary systems that have been directly imaged. Because if you have a camera, AKA a coronagraph or an adaptive optic system, for a Special camera for this, yeah. Yeah, we point it at HR8799 because it's so pretty. Nice. The system. Mm. And you can image four, one, two, three, four planets orbiting. In one fell swoop. Yeah, and I would highly recommend for your um, for your does, listeners. Does Brad Pitt know this? That <laughs> I have said it so much, I hope so. Okay. And that All I'd right. like him to just feel like the honor of the Brad Pitt status of planetary systems. HR 799, he could just call himself the HR 8799 of, uh, of, of Hollywood. <laughs> of Hollywood. I'm, I'm Hollywood's Switch HR 8799, baby. Switch it up. Just so you know. Just, right. just so Point a camera at me. So the year <laughs> I was the sexiest astrophysicist alive. Okay. This is 40 pounds ago, by the way. Um, I love that we are now measuring uh, chronology time. in pounds. That That's year, great. Brad good. Pitt was the cover as oh, sexiest man alive. Cute. Beyond category. Nice. See, me to had to be in a category right. in order to, 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 but he had no category. What yeah. year is this? <laughs> <laughs> I want to link it to HR <laughs> Next time, next question. <laughs> Don't oh, that was it. great. Next question. All right, so I have a question personally that I, I just, I'm thinking now and I, I just, I can't stop thinking about it. As you were talking about these formation mechanisms, what, what I want to know is, is it possible to have those two formation mechanisms happen simultaneously? So I'm sorry, the three formation mechanisms happen simultaneously so that you have that star that's being surrounded by a brown dwarf and planets. Yes. Can that happen? So you're asking a question that basically got asked at a seminar the other day. I ask it all the time. And the result would be, uh, is it possible that you can form a brown dwarf? Yeah. What this thing is that we call a brown dwarf, these objects that have deuterium burning and they're formed through the process of fragmentation of a giant molecular cloud, 
And you can make that same kind of object, deuterium burning, through the accretion process or gravitational fragmentation around a star. Right. And so can you get, if you're going to count up all the objects, you would see at a certain mass, you would start to get more of the object because you're forming them two different ways. And so you would see a higher number of objects popping out as you get down to like, maybe it's at 10 Jupiter masses, maybe it's at 12, maybe it's at four, whatever it is, because you're doubling down on how you form On the mechanism. Yes, you would double the number, double, maybe triple, maybe quadruple, Mm -hmm. or maybe just a little bit more, but we're looking for this exact thing, for counting up the numbers we get, and then seeing if there's any signature. (laughs) (laughs) I take it back, I take it back. Pretty good, pretty good, yes, yes, 100%. This is cool, 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 cool. cool. Excellent. No, you know. So Chuck, this is our final segment. We got to go into like lightning round. Let's move into our lightning round. Yeah, Isabel. Okay, <clears throat> go, Chuck. Oh, this is such a fascinating. So Jackie, your right? answer has to be How many a sound seconds? bite. We're testing your sound biteitude. Got it. Okay. I'm ready. All right, go, Chuck. Okay. Uh, this is Kristen Davies, and Kristen says, "I'm a seventh grade science teacher in Ohio, and I asked my students for their questions on the topic today. My students and I enjoy listening to clean episodes of Star Talk." <laughs> Okay, now you see why I'm reading Episodes this. Okay. that don't have Chuck in yeah, them. That's what I'm saying. Thanks a lot, Kristen. Yeah, but I'm the one reading your question, Kristen. Just remember that. Uh, during our study times, I listen to other episodes of my commute to work, and that gets me pumped up. So here's what she says. Uh, from the student, how many stars are in the universe? Has anyone ever counted them, and is it possible? Uh, another student says, can you turn a planet into a star? One and two questions. Okay, first question, go. All right, so number of stars in the universe. Universe. That number is insane. Number of stars in the galaxy, we're going to go with 200 billion probably. And so then there's billions and billions of galaxies. Right. That's why I'm so saying there you go. Too, too large for me to give the exact number. Second question, can you turn a planet into, into a, star? a star? Awesome question. People are trying to figure this out. Unlikely because you dump enough material onto it. It probably gets fatter and you probably can't. Ignite, Ignite unless yeah. you do a gigantic dump from something that happens. Take a dump on a star. <laughs> the, 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 that was what clean. Would you just like that? to Still dump clean. on a star. Okay. <laughs> Still clean answer. <laughs> Still clean. Fantastic. But, but, but we can do a quick, Jackie, we can do the calculation. Yeah. If, if for, the, for the number of stars. If you, if you just say our galaxy has like 100 billion stars, let's say. 200. And, let's and, go with 200 billion. But this factor two between friends. Yeah, yeah. Now, sure. Okay. So and to keep the, the math simple, 100 billion stars. Okay. And... There's somewhere between 10 and 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. So 100 billion times 100 billion, that's 10 to the 21st power. Okay, there you go. What do you call that? That's uh, one sextillion. Sextillion. That's a sextillion? Sextillion. That seems very small. Uh, Well, let's do it. So a billion is, uh, stay with me, nine zeros is a billion. Right. Trillion. Okay. Count the zero, it's just 12. 10, right. 12. Okay. Units, three zeros at a time. Because okay. it would have been 100 billion. Start, start again. Okay. 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 So, so 12 trillion. It's a trillion. 15 quadrillion. What, quadrillion. 18 quintillion. Quinn. 21 sex. sextillion. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So that's all I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. So about sextillion. No, but I'm stars. saying I'm when I say you. that seems small, I mean, it seems small. Sextillion is small to you? Yeah. No. Plus, plus, I mean, it's big. That's a number plus, I don't say because it's just It's so just too big. crazy big. No, I'm, I talking agree with about, I'm talking about when you, from where we're starting. I, I think, because you said it's only 100 billion. In our own galaxy. In our galaxy. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right, forget it then. <laughs> right. Plus, plus, plus if, if there's not a sextillion star thing, then there's two sextillion. Right. The, yeah. These, at those numbers, these factors are They don't make two. a difference. They make no difference. You want to get the sense of the right. scale right. of this more than- Which you, you still can't get the sense but of the scale. One other thing- And not all galaxies are our size. There's so, so no, there's small, small ones, small and there's big bigger ones. Bigger yeah. ones. Uh, there's collide galaxies that have merged Co- and come yeah. together. But uh, another thing they asked about counting the number of stars, and there is this survey called the, um, it's a European survey, it's called Gaia, and counting. So they have, they're called the Billion Star Survey, 1.7 Billion stars, and that's that's and th- huge. Those are not extrapolated. They right. actually counting. Counted. They've counted a billion measure stars. Measure their distances, how far away they are. It's the greatest map that humans have ever produced. One point seven billion. Billion. 
billion. Right. Objects in a catalog. That's right. like a drop the mic moment. Yeah, I can't cool. do that here. Okay, did you, you uh, did. Okay, he did. <laughs> I was gonna say, please don't let that hit the ground. Neil dropped the mic for Gaia. Excellent. Next. Okay. Keep it moving. Oh, wait. go. There we go. All right. This is from Twitter, and this is um, Akash. Akash. Akshat says this. I think that's the name. Mm. Whatever. Who cares? How do astronomers study... Akshak cares. Akshak, Akshak probably cares. <laughs> <laughs> How do astronomers study the atmospheres of brown dwarfs? Mm. And how do we even detect them? Yeah, so. that's yeah. exactly what I do for a living. Yeah. Uh, and the way that we detect it is directly. So that's the actual method Let's that we call it. Let's pause for a moment. Mm. That you can do that for a living. Yeah. I know. Isn't that, that's, that's a just, great just, thing just to say. Reflect, uh, just reflect yeah. a, a moment. Just mm -hmm. a moment. Oh. oh, let's all hold hands. Okay. Yes. Meditative moment. Yes. <laughs> okay, okay Jack. There's a right. wonderful thing that, that, you, that you can do that for a living. Brown, yeah. brown. Okay, go. Yeah. yeah. I also say the tagline for astronomers, though, is unlocking the secrets of the universe for a living. Like, that's a good tagline, right? right. You know? I mean, sure, studying the atmosphere as a brown dwarf sounds good, too, but unlocking the secrets <laughs> of the universe. Um, okay, remember, we're in lightning round. I know, so go. sorry. Direct imaging is the technique that we use. Okay. And I basically take a telescope, I point it directly at the object. Oh. For the most part, I have to use infrared instruments, though. Okay. So a wavelength of light that you can't see with your eye, mm -hmm. a wavelength that's a bit longer than the than the radiation that we all give off, uh, the heat that we give off. Uh, and um, I'll take it and I'll take the light, I pass it through a spectrograph, and I look at what it's made. What what is the chemical composition? Mm -hmm. What kinds of lines do I see? And mostly, it's molecular features. Molecules. Very molecules. cool. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Yep. Let's yep. move. There we go. Let's Keep go. It going. Uh, this is Tom Cat. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Tom Cat wants to know this. Do brown dwarfs have surfaces or are they just balls of hot gas? Go. Yeah. Nice. I, uh, that is, we're often asked this and there's no surface for you to stand on. Similar right. with Jupiter and Saturn. Right. You're not going there and standing and having a really nice time. No, yeah. No, we That's study. Why I call them gas giants. Yeah, right. gas giants. And so brown dwarfs are souped up gas giants. Okay. Very similar. So there's to no Jupiter. point deep enough where it's dense enough that you can call it a surface? There might be. We don't know. You just don't want to go. You don't <laughs> <laughs> I don't <laughs> You'll die. We all die, right? But That's hilarious. Uh, could they have some sort of core similar to Jupiter or Saturn, mm -hmm. which would have some sort of core? Very well, it could have that. We don't know yet, though. All right, good. Excellent. This is ooh, Luigi Vane. Luigi Vane says this. How do we know what a planet is made of and if it has an atmosphere, mm. if it goes by how much light passes through or by it? So that sounds like they're asking about the transit method. Pretty much. Uh, one of the ways that we detect planets is by looking at the planet pass in front of its host star between your eyeball and that host star. And there's there's lots of methods that astronomers have developed to look at the light of the star very, very carefully and see if there's any change in it as they are suspecting the transit is happening. You have to have the timing down, like smack down, to when that transit is happening, you look right at the star and you can see what it's made of. This is very complicated. We see what the atmosphere of the planet, the transiting planet is made of. Right. right. Through the light of the host star. Mm -hmm. It's a very complicated method. Uh, my preference, just to re regage us back to brown dwarfs, is we draw upon what we do in bl brown dwarf science. Since we directly detect the atmospheres, we can guide any measurements that you want to make when you're trying to uh, make detections. Oh, of so objects. you have ground truth of we, what the atmosphere might exactly. be for those who are looking for the transit in front of a, a much brighter star in the background. Mm -hmm. We are yeah. ground truth for transiting planets, Ooh. especially hot Jupiters, these objects that are pretty close in that are like Jupiter. Ooh. Cool. All, All right. right, here right. we go. Dang. Actually, we, I think we just ran out of time. Did we really? We ran out of time. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, Chuck, I'm sorry okay. about that. All right. That's oh, sad. Oh, oh, that is sad. So many questions. You know what I think we should have? We should have put a few of those online and have Jackie answer them. To, mm. to oh, that's a good idea. I think of that. Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll put in for that. I'll it's amazing. I mean, people really people are all excited into about it. brown dwarfs, man. Boom. Into what you get paid yeah, for. They really yeah, yeah, are. get paid to do this for a living. <laughs> yeah, for Pretty a good living. job. Pretty good job. <laughs> all right, Jackie, thanks for being on Star Toys. Not yeah. your first rodeo with us. And so no, thanks well, for being on. I've done All Stars with Chuck, but this is the first time we've it's ever done one. It's our first one. time. Oh, it we is our do first time. Yeah. Oh, so you go way back. 
Yeah, too. I'm at HR 80. <laughs> I'm at HR 799. Of co host. <laughs> All right, this brings this episode of Star Talk to a close. I thank my co host, Chuck Nice, Always a my friend and colleague, Jackie Faraday. Thanks for coming on. And as always, I bid you to keep looking up. Thanks to Storyblocks for sponsoring this episode of Star Talk. We know a lot of you like science, and that's why you listen to this podcast. So if you also like making science videos, Storyblocks has so much science stuff. They have chemical formulas to make you look smart, scientists working in labs, human anatomy, and more. It doesn't stop there. You've seen us use space video before, and they also have atomic stuff, and for some reason, this scientist in a bubble suit. Make yourself look like a professional filmmaker with Storyblocks Unlimited Plan. That's unlimited 4K royalty-free stock footage. They also have audio, photo, and video templates. So what are you waiting for? Head to the link in the description and get started with Storyblocks today. Storyblocks.com slash StarTalk. 